the fact that other people have to justify their choices of policies in person. Like when they say, well, we're going to choose a policy that harms the renters. You have to explain that to this woman and she will tell you about our experience. Whereas if you're just a group of rich lawyers like the American Congress, it's very easy to ignore the, the lived in experience and the suffering and the lives of these uh, invisible people. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. I think it's fair to say that democracy isn't in great shape. According to Freedom House, nearly three quarters of the world's population live in a country that experienced democratic deterioration last year. There are probably a number of factors behind this. After decades of democratic expansion, illiberalism is on the rise, and autocratic countries such as China and Russia are gaining influence. But another reason for this, which is harder to admit, is that democratic governments themselves, particularly in the United States, haven't performed all that well in recent years. They have led to the election of liberal leaders like Donald Trump, often with only small pluralities of support. They failed to hold power to account, whether that's big tech, big pharma, or big oil. And I think more generally speaking, people are questioning just how good their governments are at actually governing, particularly when it comes to big collective action issues like climate change or the pandemic. In other words, a liberalism is expanding at the same time as democracies are struggling. But what if the problem isn't that our democracies are failing? but it's that we've never had true democracy at all. This idea is at the heart of Elan Landamore's work. Elan is a professor of political science at Yale and the author of the books Open Democracy and Debating Democracy. Elan says that our conventional interpretation of democracy, the one where we cast a vote every couple of years for a candidate or a political party, isn't actually all that democratic. Instead, she proposes a radical reimagining of our democratic processes, something she calls open democracy. In an open democracy, groups of citizens deliberate on key issues and create policy solutions to address them. And what's really exciting is this isn't some abstract academic idea. It's being implemented in democratic experiments around the world. In France, 150 citizens were tasked with developing a climate policy. In Iceland, citizens drafted a modern update to their constitution. And here in Canada, we're doing it for tech policy. I co-chair something called the Canadian Commission on Democratic Expression with Beverly McLaughlin, the former Supreme Court Chief Justice. At the center of this initiative are 42 citizens developing their own agenda for governing big tech. Watching them work through this problem has been eye-opening and has radically changed my view on public policy, citizenship, and democracy. At a time when we're increasingly divided, when our politics are more toxic than ever, it's tremendously reassuring to see the emergence of new models of governance. And as you'll see in our conversation, both Alain and I are excited and optimistic about the possibility of reimagining democracy. And I think after hearing this, you might be too. Here's Elan Landamore. So I'm really excited to talk to you. I just finished this Citizens' Assembly in Canada. Um, The second year in a row we've done a Citizens' Assembly on democratic expression. What? Oh, wow, very good. Uh, So you're running it? or you? Yeah, we're in year two now. How many people are in Forty. This year was 42. Okay. But it's been interesting because we have these, like, commissioners who are, like, experts on this area and like former Supreme Court judges. And then we have the Citizen Assembly and they both look at the same thing. And it's been fascinating to see the differences. Yeah. The differences. Yeah. And it's, and it's made me a a total convert on this concept. Yeah. Once you've seen it from within, I think it's hard to not be, I mean, I just don't know anyone who's actually been resistant, but I think most people still have a very, very much an outsider view. Even my students, you know, I, they are, they are really, I think there's a selection bias here. If they take my class, usually they tend to be already predisposed to embrace, you know, these kind of democratic innovations. 
But some of them, because it remains quite theoretical, they read about it. They don't really take part in it or observe it. I think once you see it and how it works, you, you realize these objections are very theoretical and abstract and they don't apply, actually. Yeah, which says something about our broader conversation about democracy, frankly, that yeah, we, yeah. we put them in this like theoretical space when, yeah. when we have to live them, right, for it to matter. Yeah. It takes time. That's a problem. If you have to convert people one at a time, it's really difficult. So. Yeah, I mean, this was a five-month process with 42 people. <laughs> like, That's a real commitment from everybody involved, yeah. right? It's, and it's not cheap. Oh, exciting. <laughs> so I want to learn more about that. Honestly, it was it was awesome. And I, I think on... On issues like regulating speech, which are have become very political and politicized, it is amazing that if you get 42 really diverse Canadians in a room, they overcome almost all of those ideological divides. There was consensus, basically, across the room on 90% of what they recommended. I mean, it was truly incredible. Oh, and, and, and every time, like, again, the, the objection from the outside is like, well, in a diverse country like the U.S., which is so polarized, like, it mm. would never work. And... No, it works. It's about incentives and design and, and uh, you know, letting people figure it out for themselves. Yeah. So there's a real theme in our politics at the moment around a liberal trends and the rise of sort of liberal politics coming from whether it be Trump or from the alt-right or from certain progressive movements. Um, but it, do you think the problem is actually with democracy itself? Um, yes, I tend to think that, you know, uh, the problem dates back to the 18th century design choices that were made by the federalists in the U.S., by, uh, you know, the, the theorists and, and politicians and, and sort of like... Uh, political innovators of this time, they, they, they stuck with a relatively oligarchic understanding of who should have power and should, who should make the decisions. And that has had consequences, I think in recent years particularly, um, that led to profound dissatisfaction among majorities and, and certain powerful minorities. And then it creates a backlash against the institutions because in my view, they are not sufficiently democratic and because they're too elitist. Is that a design flaw of representation? Because representation sort of demands a certain degree of elitism, right? Of deference to others. See, but that's the thing. Words can mean several things. And for some reason, what we mean by democratic representation has always meant only one thing. It's a very narrow understanding of democratic representation. It means electoral representation. Mm. But conceptually, no, there's no reason why it should be an electoral representation exclusively, which is a very elitist understanding of representation. If you go back to the Greeks, it meant something else. It meant that you had a uh, random selection of rulers and people could then rule and being ruled in turn. So one way to not take this example seriously, uh, the, the way I see that we bury this example is by saying, well, they didn't really have representation. Well, it's not true. They did delegate power to a subset of the polity because not everybody could rule you know, together at once, even in a smaller group. So they did have representations. It's just not true. They didn't have elections when it came to appointing um, people to office, but they had other methods. Um, so it's very, so, so what I think happened is that we're, we've, we've backed ourselves into a corner where Democratic representation can only mean one thing, electoral representation, but it's not very democratic, actually. Mm. What other principles other than representation do you see as being critical for democracy? Deliberation is a big one. Um, mm. It's the idea that, you know, uh, to me is completely intuitive, but turns out it's not really taken seriously either, mm. that laws and policies can only be legitimate to the extent that they've been passed through, you know, an exchange of reasons among citizens on an equal and inclusive basis. I mean, to me, again, it's totally intuitive because people are owed reasons for the laws that constrain them. And also because it has good outcomes. You know, if, if you include more people in the conversation, in the deliberation, you get the benefits of uh, cognitive diversity, uh, different ways of looking at problems and, and coming up with solutions, which benefits the group ultimately. So, so what moments in, in the history of democracy do you think got this 
more right or saw this in different ways than we do now that are worth highlighting? Um, so I think if the Greeks got it more right on some dimensions, so they got mm. it more wrong on many dimensions. I mean, mm. of course, you know, they excluded too many people. Yeah. They excluded women, they excluded foreigners, they had a very narrow conception of citizenship. But when it came to actual rule, uh, democratic rule, I think they did it better because they distributed power a lot more equally. Uh, and they used random selection, they had popular juries, they had brutal accountability mechanism that are actually a lot more efficient than the ones we have today. We always say, oh, without elections, you can't have accountability. Well, it's just not true. The Greeks had, you know, uh, the practice of ostracism, so the looming threat of being exiled from, from the country for, for 10 years if you looked like you were going to take over the institution or be a threat. So, of course, it's probably too too illiberal for our tastes and too uh, prone to abuse. So I don't think we should return to that practice, but I'm just saying there are other methods. And then other countries, you know, got it perhaps more right than others. Of course, it looks like Scandinavia in general is a much more functioning uh, type of democracy than many other countries. So it could be for exogenous reasons because they're ind independently wealthy. Some, some, some of these countries have oil and all that. But I also think it's because it, it's superimposed on a, on a very deep tradition of social equality and a commitment to consensus and deliberation that I think actually uh, help counter some of the bad tendencies of party-based systems and electoral systems. And that process can be, that democratic process, it seems, in all of those examples, can exist somewhat distinctly from the elections that created the representation. Exactly. And they, and they track ancient practices that it turns out um, probably existed all around the world, not you know before the Greek example actually. So it was just talking around the tree uh, under the tree and, and figure things out and trying to be inclusive and, and, and listening. Even when there were local chiefs, they were kind of like encouraged to listen and, and, and integrate the feedback of the entire community, or they would not be considered good leaders. So proto-democratic rather than truly democratic, but that is um, still a, a sort of good precedent. And you seem to go even a step further, though, and and say and argue that like there's something even almost counterproductive about the electoral act in, some, in this process, and that the act of elections itself can be either discriminatory or elitist or undermine the democratic process itself, which is very counterintuitive, I think. For people. It is counterintuitive, but I think it's true. Uh, <laughs> it's in the name, you know, like the Greeks thought, thought that elections were by construction elitist and oligarchic, because what happens when human choice plays a part? We go towards the salient people, right? In the community, for, they could be salient for all kinds of reasons, because they're tall, because they are male, because they are the dominant ethnicity, because they are wiser which could be a good argument but it's or, still or just well spoken or good looking or whatever yeah no, or just yeah. rich um yeah yeah or famous and, and i think it gets amplified and even worse um as the scale of the polity gets larger because these side effects just become even um worse and it's sort of winner takes all logic where in a two million people country, while the salient people are, you know, a guy like Trump or or Kim Kardashian, or like, so it becomes a star system at the expense of the shy, the the, the inarticulate, the socially invisible. That that's that's what's bad about elections. I mean, if you're serious about the meaning of a democracy, which is about, in my mind, equal power, then e elections are counterproductive. So your idea and your contribution to, to get to these problems, to addressing these problems, um, is what you call open democracy. But I'm wondering if you can walk through that as a process, as a separate process. So what are the core elements of thinking about democracy in this, in this quite different way? Well, if you think of electoral democracy as a closed democracy where power is restricted to people who can win elections, and you end up with a sort of like uh, political fortress, which is closed off to most people, then what I wanted to think of and imagine was the opposite of that, a sort of open democracy where you, you know, create windows and doors in the walls of the representative places, parliaments, uh, places like that, 
And you, can, you have basically two choices there. You can either say, well, okay, let's open the doors and let anyone in who wants to come in. That's self-selection. Or you can have uh, another method, which is, well, we can't have everybody come in. It's going to be a mess. So we're going to distribute chances over time to all, but at any point in time, it's going to be a subset. So then you do a random selection process, which, by the way, is the, the idea behind the jury system, right? So that, that's, that's the idea of, of open democracy. Like any one of us, including the shy, the inarticulate, the socially invisible, should be allowed an access to the center of power, which for me is lawmaking. And, and to, but to do that, though, you need new institutional structures or new, at least formal processes, or else it's just governance via polling or, right? Or, I mean, there's these much more open processes of like liquid democracy where everybody can vote on everything. And it doesn't seem to me that's like what you're talking about. You're talking about a much more um, deliberative institutional exactly. structure, right? Right. Because you could also say, you're right, that you could also say, well, democracy is one person, one vote. Uh, we, we don't have to use that system to select people to rule for us. We could just rule di- directly. But because I, I mentioned before, like deliberation is quite central to my understanding of a, f- of, a, of a desirable form of democracy. This is not feasible. You, aggregating votes will never get you to a deliberative sort of a, a lawmaking process. So the, the beauty of deliberation is that it can tap and aggregate the, the wisdom of many and, and uh, offer opportunities for problem solving, creation of an identity or so uh, consensus formation, all that. The downside of deliberation, like voting, is that you can only do so in a small group when it comes to actually generating laws, right? Polling or or just uh, mass referenda are, I think, important. It's a way to measure the temperature of the country and and, uh, having a sense. And at some point, you you just need an aggregative phase. That's fine to to decide. But when it comes to deliberation, I think it needs a... It needs a lot of investment. It's something that it's a technology that we don't master very well, and that needs to be uh, practiced and, and learned, and in, involves a certain number of norms that need to be followed. And so it's it's difficult. But in recent uh, years, I would say the last forty years, there's been this current called deliberative democracy, precisely that that builds on very old intuitions. Of course, that you can trace back all the way to Aristotle and and before, but but really has has crystallized as a academic sort of field where we try to figure out like how do you conduct deliberation in a way that's authentically inclusive, that leads to good outcomes, uh, that makes a measurable impact, um, that takes into account the you know racial and gender dynamics uh, and try to correct for them. It's it's becoming it's become a, a field of its own since the you know seminal work of people like Habermas and Josh Cohen and so now we're in the empirical phase, and it's quite exciting to see that there are more than 600 examples now uh, documented by uh, by the OECD of deliberative mini publics. So you know, uh, groups of randomly selected citizens brought together to deliberate about issues. And the big question for me now is like, well, we have all this evidence of what works, what doesn't. What's the next step? How do we institutionalize such deliberative mini publics? of ordinary citizens so that they actually transform the way we make decisions, policies, and laws in, in existing democracies. It's very hard to figure out the way to articulate these new ways of bringing in citizens to existing modes of policymaking. Yes, so I want to talk about that because, I, as I mentioned, I've been involved in a couple of these processes in Canada and recently, and I think that final step is is just massively important in the implementation of this because it without that last step, you lose all legitimacy for the very thing that was intending to bring legitimacy to the democratic process, arguably. So I think that last step's really important. But but first, can you just walk through what one of these might, what looked like? Like, I mean, one of the ones you've been involved with, either Iceland or France, and just like, just very briefly, like walk through what that deliberation process is, because I don't think a lot of people have a really tangible sense of what happens in one of these. So I'll talk about the one that I actually uh, sat on for nine months, uh, the French Citizens Convention for Climate. So in France, we had this big social crisis in November 2018 after President Macron and his government tried to pass a carbon tax in the, in the, in the guise of a fuel tax, and it generated enormous backlash, and, and the, the Yellow Vest movement was born. So the Yellow Vest are people who live in uh, rural, semi-rural areas. They need a car to commute to work. And so they were particularly punished by this carbon tax. 
So they gathered on traffic circles. They, they started putting on this neon yellow jacket to, to become visible. It was such a good metaphor, you know. So the whole country sort of rallied behind them, actually, because everybody felt that this was indeed very unfair. And at some point, like over 80% of the population was supporting the movement. And it, it brought the country to a halt. And also that there started to be a lot of violence as well. So Macron said, OK, we need to, to, to pause here and talk to each other. So he created this process called the Great National Debate that lasted two months. And at the end, one of the recommendations that emerged from this deliberative moment was we need a citizens' assembly on environmental issues. So that's what he did. He convened a body of 150 randomly selected citizens from all of our friends, and he brought them for seven weekends to come up with quasi-legal proposals on how to curb uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 40% of the 1990s levels, by 2030, in a way that would be compatible with social justice, in a way, basically, that wouldn't trigger the yellow vests. <laughs> right, or, or would diffuse them in some way. I mean, it was an enormous yeah. task. And I, and I remember when, when, um, when he did that, I thought, oh my God, this is too difficult a topic. You know, it's, it's going to create a backlash against the citizens' assemblies because it might not work. Turns out it worked beautifully. So these um, 150 citizens came, they met. After three sessions, I, it was palpable that there was a sense of community and solidarity and a great love, actually, between the participants. It was very moving to see. And building on that foundation of like a sense of being in it together across partisan divides, across social, cultural, economic mm -hmm. divides, they came up with 149 proposals some of them quite radical, that they then put to the parliament uh, and, and the government. In the end, uh, only somewhere between 10% and 50% of the proposals went through and, and were adopted, uh, depending on who you ask. But it still led to the most ambitious climate bill that France has ever produced. So that's what uh, um, a citizen's assembly can do in the best case scenario. You say they came together with love in those conversations. I mean, what, what does that look like? And what's that conversation oh look God. like where I, people I, love was, each other? <laughs> so I, I still haven't found the time to write about this because I don't know how to. I think in academia, we don't know how to talk about love. It sounds so corny <laughs> and unmanageable. And, but for me, that was the biggest shock. The third session, I, I guarantee you, I saw people literally declare love, their love for each other and like hug each other. And, and I thought this can't be real. And this has got to go away. Maybe it's the sort of, um, the sort of cook up pressure effect of you know, people in uh, TV reality shows. You put them together in intense conditions for several days and then all these emotions start exploding. And, but it's not true. I think uh, they, they continued loving each other and, and there were feuds and there were, there were all kinds of things as well. Not, this wasn't all rosy, but you ask them now, they, they will tell you this was the most intense experience of their life and the most transformative. And so to me, it's like, I think people can perhaps relate when they think of um, when they went to college or when they moved countries or, or cities or when they were exposed to something radically new and met people they would have never met otherwise. And I think you only get that in, in a lifetime, maybe once or twice or three times. Mm. And I think that's what was most transformative. So I saw you know, a banker become friends with a butcher, um, you know, older people befriending younger, very much younger people. And I, I think um, you can't really understand this un until you see it. Um, when you read academic work on this, all that emotional, uh, interrelational, subjective dimension is kind of like passed over because, again, we don't really have the tools to talk about this. Um, it sounds like cheap psychology and and but i think that's what's really striking in fact about yeah, I, I couldn't agree more and like the i think the distance between the way it's talked about both in the public and in academic work um and the theory around it and that personal interaction and deeply personal human aspect to it is is a real challenge right yeah and i'm afraid we we academics and commentators we, we make it sound boring when in fact yeah. Truly, like I wish, so the, the hope is that at some point in the media, we learn how to talk about those things in a way that's not electoral. Because what I no noticed, and I had the conversation with journalists in France about this, they come in and they go straight for the electoral types, the charismatic ones, the ones who want to bring, keep the attention, attract the attention. And, and, I, and I don't think that's the 
thing that matters in these assemblies, the we matters, the, the group dynamic matters. But how do you how do you put that in a narrative? How you how do you talk about it in a way that translates and travels to an external audience? It's very difficult. I think that there's been now that I've seen a few doc documentaries who are doing a better job at telling those stories, it's still very hard. In fact, if you think about even movies, it's always about one hero. I mean, especially American movies. Think about 12 Angry Men, which is a movie I, I used in my previous work. It pictures the juror number eight, like the lone dissenter, the hero who helped the group, you know, get to the truth. And I think it's that's actually not true. I think this movie is just is, is as much about the collective intelligence of the group as like the lone dissenter. But it's really hard to sort of uh, change the way we look at human stories and not look for the hero, not look for the electoral type. We it's hard to look at the, the less striking characters and see their value. And I think this is what these assemblies um, can help us reconnect with this idea that we are all valuable, even when we have very little to say, even when we are just there. Because, for example, you know, I, I remember this um, woman who was living on social welfare, was probably beaten up by her boyfriend, to be honest, uh, really like... Uh, had a really hard time and and she socialized with the women who were in similar situations and they came in for the you know for the money and they they were very explicit about the worry that they would be taxed because they would, would put them over a threshold and and i was thinking what do they bring to the table well what they bring to the table is even just a, the fact that other people have to justify their choices of policies in person like when they say well we're gonna choose a policy that harms the renters you have to explain that to this woman and she will tell you about our experience and it's going to be very hard. Whereas if you're just a group of rich lawyers like the American Congress, it's very easy to ignore the, the lived in experience and the suffering and, and the lives of these uh, invisible people. I, I think that's such a profound aspect of this and, and point. I mean, in, in the one I was involved in was on democratic expression and whether we should be regulating certain kinds of speech online. And as you know, it's like a it's a it's a very political debate. It's um, becoming very toxic, and yet you get people in a room to talk about it, and almost all of those differences go away because if if someone's going to tell me they want absolute free speech, someone else in the room might point out the harms to them personally of that speech, and and that's a totally different conversation, and it gets you to a really different point in terms of your your resolution of that problem, right? Of your, your solutions to it. And it's it's profound, I think. Absolutely. And and the best example of that, actually, is probably the, the Irish Citizens Assembly of 2016, which was on abortion. Because here you have an extremely sensitive issue that kind of formed the third rail of Irish politics. That's, that's the reason why the politicians decided to create a citizens' assembly. They couldn't agree among themselves because they were committed to party positions. And even if they, on a personal level, wanted to be a bit more lenient, they, they had to be against abortion at all costs. And then you bring this, this sample of 99 randomly selected citizens. Some of them are very much pro-life. Some of them are very much pro-choice. You, you'd think, well, it's going to be a stale stalemate. It's going to veer into anger, invectives, uh, distrust, and all that, not at all. They converged on a consensus, a painful one, that they had to decriminalize abortion. And, and even those who think that life is sacred, and they, they, they learned that, well, on the political level, they'll have to live with this right of women because the stories they heard from women who were raped, you know, women who went through incest and medical situations that were really difficult, it just made sense. It just made sense in a very practical, human way. And, and it, it, that goes beyond the, the posturing and the ideology and all the abstract commitments that I think get in the way of actually getting to an agreement. So I'm fully convinced in the power of this process and just I'm tremendously excited and filled with kind of hope for it ultimately. I mean, it's not often you are hopeful in the state of our democracy at the moment, but I think this is like a, this is a place of that, of legitimate optimism and hope. Um, one of the concerns though I have about it 
is what happens when you create such a powerful tool for a group of citizens. They come to a resolution or a set of ideas that might have broad popular support and buy-in from the public, and yet they don't get implemented by our current formal governance structures, our legislatures, our courts, whatever it might be. Do you see that as a problem? And do you see a way of, like, how do we formally connect this process into our institutions? Um, and is there a real risk if we don't? Yes, I, I, I think you've kind of answered the question. Yes, if there is a real risk that you will make people disillusioned with this processes and that they will see them as participation washing, which in many cases they actually are. Mm. Um, that wasn't the case in Ireland, for example, where you know the proposal to decriminalize abortion was put to a referendum and it passed with, I think, 66% of approval in the population, which was roughly the margin of approval in the, in the deliberative assembly itself. Uh, there are other uh, good stories like that. The French case that I was mentioning before is a sort of um, halfway house here because there was actually, it turns out, huge popular support for many of the uh, proposals, most of the proposals, including the boldest one in my mind, which was the mandatory um, housing retrofitting to make housing carbon neutral by a certain date. And it turns out 74% of the French population would have supported something like that. But because none of the proposals went to a referendum, those proposal went to die in parliament and in ministries. Why? Because lobbies are there and they will prevent the things from happening and parties who are afraid of losing elections will say, no, 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 we don't want to expose ourselves to something like this. So it's fascinating to see the disconnect between majorities and, and the, the result that the current system gives them. Um, so now what do you do? Well, I think you need to start institutionalizing these bodies. So that means uh, giving them, you know, legal status. It means potentially going through constitutional reform to create a fourth or a third chamber called the House of the People or something else, where it would be like a parliament, but just made up of randomly selected citizens, which leads me to another point, which is which hasn't been solved yet. Um, the governance of those assemblies, because, you know, parliaments are not managed and governed from the outside by democracy experts and that's still the case for those mini publics they are governed from the outside so uh, we have to figure out how can we empower those assemblies so that ordinary citizens in them are not micromanaged sort of piloted and uh, nudged from without but truly make their own decisions about the, the procedures that they use within their own assembly the topics they deal with and um, and the way they're you know sessions go. Yeah, I almost feel there needs to be some self-governance mechanisms embedded in the assembly itself, because I think you're right. Like, if you're only meeting a, a dozen times or half a dozen times, and you're entering into a brand new topic, um, you, are hev you can be heavily influenced by the people and ideas you're exposed to. And ensuring that there's some representation to those ideas and to that process feels pretty important. Actually, my experience with the French Citizen Convention leads me to think that they are not that influenceable, actually. Um, they don't let experts really tell them what to do. But I'm more worried about the implicit effect that procedures that are considered, oh, it's just a technical decision, have on, on the way the deliberation goes. For example, I think practitioners, you know, these uh, NGOs or, or um, service providers that are asked to guide the deliberation and structure them, they're committed to consensus at any cost, for example. That's what I observe. Like they have this vision, which is very 1990s, that the point is to get to a consensus. So they tend to kill off the emergence of disagreement. I'm not sure it's a good idea, actually. And at any rate, I think it should be up to the citizens themselves to decide how much the procedure should guide them towards consensus or, or how much they should have the freedom to disagree in various uh, voting sessions or things like that. But ultimately, right. it has to be the case. Otherwise, they won't be fully autonomous and sovereign. And th that that's what we should aim for, I think. And it defeats some of the core value or purpose of it to begin with then. I mean, yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. So, so what happens 
if we add a layer of technology on top of open democracy? Do you see an opportunity or do you see some some potential um, challenges with that? So I'm an optimist, so I always go for the, the opportunities. Um, also, the pandemic actually proved that technology was an opportunity, I made it possible for citizens to meet online on Zoom. Uh, it, it was really like necessary. And it turns out that deliberation is not that bad online. Um, it has a somewhat egalitarian effect. I mean, there's a digital divide, but if you can fix that once people are on Zoom, I found that women were more comfortable talking in that sort of um, setting than in plenaries, for example, where physically your, your voice has to be loud, you have to have a, a kind of persona to, to, to really like stand up and address an entire room. It's, it's, it's intimidating in some ways. So, so the, the technological aspect can, can free that. Another way in which, it, in which it was good was that the chat function really helped keep track of what people are thinking in real time, even as the course mm. was ongoing. So yeah. I could give you many examples. The one that ticks that for me is the, the question of the referendum. Um, the way the expert who presented the options to the French group proceeded, they kind of discarded the option of multiple choice referendum because it's, it's not something that exists in, the, in French law. You have to hold multiple referenda at the same time to have the equivalent. So the lawyers are like, ah, oh, too complicated. We've never done it in France. We're not going to talk about it. And then in the chat, you had people who are like, well, what about the multiple choice referendum? Like in Ireland, that's what they did. And if it hadn't been for that technological aspect, I'm not sure this weak signal would have emerged in a more uh, technology-free environment. I mean, that, those are all the optimistic reasons. <laughs> my, my, my slightly more pessimistic challenge on it is that, I mean, we've, we've in many ways evolved our public sphere into these private spaces managed by technology companies. And I guess I'm, I get a little nervous, and we know the sort of downfalls of that and the potential risks of that. And I guess I'm now nervous that we're talking about these very critical places of democratic deliberation and then handing those over to these same technologies or technology companies feels like there's some risk there to me. Well, so you, I think you're thinking of Facebook and, and think of Twitter and things like that. Or even the design of AI or like the companies that might build an AI or a machine learning. Well, that, that's the problem is that the, the, as long as you design for profit, for attention farming and for the wrong kinds of things, you will get the wrong kinds of impact and results. And not only that, as long as you design algorithm within the context of profoundly unequal and oligarchic corporations, you're also designing for the right. wrong thing and the wrong product. So I think that that demands a much bigger picture conversation about, you know, how do we reinvent a democratic economy? How do we empower workers? Mm. Because at the end of the day, the engineers who are designing the algorithms are just doing what they're told, right? They don't have much of a say. And if they do, they either get fired or, you know, if they the whistleblowers, they're taking extraordinary risk. So you need to have their voices at the top of the company as well. And that can only be done through authentic democratic representation. Mm. That would mean another big padding shift where you start thinking of companies as mini states, you know, polities, uh, where it's completely unfair that only shareholders have a say on, on everything, including product design and algorithm. Well. We we get we could talk for another hour about how we might make these <laughs> how we might govern these companies like like states or democratically. But I I guess just to 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 close here. I mean, we're sort of overcome at the moment by these big global collective action problems of climate change, of how we govern emerging technologies, of AI, of these really big problems. Um, and I'm wondering if you think we're even capable of doing that unless we address our democratic processes and institutions first. Like, is our, is our system even capable of dealing with those kinds of problems right now? Uh, uh, it's a very, very difficult question. I, I think we'll have to solve them at the same time uh, and, and preferably rather quickly. So another example of a sort of hopeful attempt to do something in that direction is uh, the Global Assembly. It's a group of 100 randomly selected uh, people at the global scale. They were selected on the basis of their geographic location at random, and they were brought together virtually on a platform to think about how to fix climate change in a, in a, in a just way, I guess. 
And they did that in the margins of the COP26, you know, which brings together stakeholders, but mostly various elites. And the hope is that this will become a, a fixture of global conversations about climate change. And then in a year from now, they can convene not just a hundred, which is a very, very small number, but like at least a thousand and maybe ultimately even more randomly selected people from all over the globe so that you get the voice of like what happened this time, uh, a shepherd from Afghanistan who cannot read and, and who has a view about what's going on and how it affects his, his family and his community. And, and those voices are absolutely never heard, especially at the global level in the existing in, in international institutions. So that's how you start fixing things, in particular, the, the big global north-south divide, where, whereby, you know, most international institutions are controlled by representatives of the global north. And it's very hard for the representatives of small islands that are going to be washed over, you know, by rising seas to, to get anything, given the representative structure. So again, it might, the, the worry is that if it is indeed the case that we have very little time left, um, it might take too long for these changes to, to take place. But at the same time, I'm not entirely sure that the autocratic temptation of letting experts make up a plan and then coercively enforcing it on everyone is a solution. Because look, Macron couldn't even get a carbon tax passed without triggering a massive social movement. So if our well-meaning global elites think they can get away with imposing the equivalent at the global level without pushback, I, I think they're fooling themselves. Yeah, I mean, I do wonder if I mean, that, that global assembly, in a way, I'm sure includes participants from non-democratic countries. It does. So yeah. in a way, you're bringing open democracy to the sort of global scale and leapfrogging our national institutions, which some of which aren't democratic at all. Yes, uh, which you know, raises all kinds of questions. Like, actually, I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me that climate change is a global phenomenon and the morally relevant units are individuals, not mm. countries. Yeah. Uh, so I think having a place where it's really a chamber of the people, as people, regardless of where they come from and which country and citizenship they have. Do you, do you legitimately think this is going to take off? Like, do you... Th do you do you have a lot of optimism around this being really formally brought in to governments? I, well, I think it might take off in in uh, in Europe. I just I just I've lost lost hope for the U.S. I think the U.S. the U.S. is collapsing. It's it's past the tipping point. I'm I'm really pessimistic about the U.S. It's too late. I mean, we're not. It, it's like we're talking about even preserving electoral democracy at this point, not improving it. <laughs> Right, and and that's the point that you want to start fixing, not save. Yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. they're starting at a very different baseline at the moment. Yes, yeah, so so yeah. I feel like it's 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 um since the situation is not as dire in at least Western Northern Europe, yeah, there you, it makes sense to try those things. Here, I mean, you're basically it's the Titanic. So it's first of all we have to preserve basic freedoms and yeah, and there's too much role for for money in politics. I find that irreversible. I don't, I don't see how you come back from that. It's rotten to the core. The U.S. at this point. On that, I thought we were almost going to end on a hopeful note, but then we had to <laughs> collapse back into pessimism. <laughs> you know, that's the state of the world at I the guess moment. I I can take the, this two years of pandemic and, and everything. Oh, yeah. It's just I, I'm losing faith sometimes. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. That was my conversation with Elaine Landamore. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation in association with Antica Productions. The show is produced by Trevor Hunsberger, Debbie Pacheco, and Mitchell Stewart, with associate producer Abi Raheja. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursday every week.